I think our clutter is costing us so much more than we realize. We know there's the lost cost when we have to replace something because we can't find it or the extra time searching for it or even the time maintaining it. Today, I'm gonna visit with Dr. John Deloney. I have a question I'm gonna ask him and I have a feeling that, that you're gonna wanna know the answer to it too. So Dr. John, I was uh, listening to an interview with Rain Wilson. So he's best known as Dwight on The Office. Of course. And he was talking about he had a friend that was passing away from cancer. Mm -hmm. And so he said every week he would go for a walk with him. And he said towards the end, his friend was just pleading with him. He's like, Rain, it's all static. It's all static. The Zoom calls, the traffic, the text messages. He's like, it's all static. And I was, I was listening to that. I'm like, oh, my goodness, that's the clutter too right uh, the stuff in our house that it's one day can be so important and then something happens and you're like who cares mm -hmm. it's it's all static what's fascinating to me about this though is that we will all sit here and agree and be like yeah mm -hmm. right and i think probably the one thing we could all agree on as human beings is that none of us can take any of it with us mm -hmm. no matter what our faith background or our beliefs are i don't think anyone is under the illusion that we can take any of this stuff with us mm -hmm. but yet here we are surrounded by all of this stuff and it is eating up our time and our energy um, it's causing us to feel stressed and anxious but why is it so hard to let it go then and so i'm hoping you'll help us unravel that <laughs> a little bit today i know i'm hoping was, you wouldn't help me yeah but, i love that you mention it in yeah, your new book yeah. uh, building a non-anxious life and so that's my hope for today an important what i would call one of the cornerstones of that book came from a conversation you and i had in in minnesota together like mm -hmm. it sent me on a, another rabbit hole that yeah i didn't really knew ex no existed right yeah. and it all comes down to this in, you know we've talked about this before in in private conversation but we can think things all day long yeah we can have good ideas all day long and i think that's been one of the failures of the mental health community over the last couple hundred years is mm -hmm. that mental health is just getting all the right thoughts in the right order mm -hmm. i think it completely ignores a body that's been wired for gajillions of years in a very particular pattern to keep us safe and alive mm -hmm. right. and that is get stuff yeah always be ready for the next thing coming over the mountain yeah and look out so i save every piece of string and i get every right. book that might have some information in it and then that becomes identity over time i, I it, you know i've thought my, my issues I, I i get guitars because i want to it's my link to staying young mm -hmm. and cool and hip yeah. and um and i love playing right yeah but it's this constant you got to get and you got to get and then when my wife's like oh another deep freezer huh yeah. you know what i mean right. and you're going hunting again. I think we're good for the next four calendar years. And it's right. like I know, but right. So it's it's a body that's trying to keep us safe. Yeah. And we divorce that with all these fancy thoughts of oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, right. right. And so I think very, um, it, it's like the duck on the water. Our feet are kicking and kicking and kicking, trying to keep us safe. Mm -hmm. And until you can align both of those things and connect them and say, I got to choose reality. This is where I'm at. We're okay. I yeah. can push a button on my phone and food shows up. Right. I don't need a third deep freezer. Let's right. be honest. Right. Now I have to live in that tension. Yeah. And so today we're with Dr. John Deloney, best-selling author. You have your new book out, yeah. uh, Building a Non-Anxious Life, also host of the Dr. John Deloney Show. So we'll link to all that down below. I heard you on a, a call the other day and there was a gal and she was talking about uh, cutting her dad out of her life. Mm -hmm. He had done things that she was like, I don't think I can be in relationship with him anymore, but this is a big decision. And right today, right here, it feels right. But I'm just thinking ahead. I have a daughter. What about in a year? What about in five years, 10 years? Is this still going to be the right decision? And what you told her was that that is just a recipe for anxiety. Mm -hmm. If you are trying to, to predict how you are going to feel in the future, that is just going to cause anxiety, right? All you can do is make the best decision for yourself right now. And I was like, but that's what decluttering is. <laughs> that's what it is, right? Like, yeah. I am trying to make a very logical, wise decision. Am I going to need this mm -hmm. item in the future? And so... Uh, like, how do I just say, like, oh, I don't need it and let this money go out the window, let this sense of security mm -hmm. go out the window? Because, yeah, right now the economy is good ish. We have mm -hmm. we have money. I can buy food. I have enough. But what about a year from now or five years from now or 10 years from mm -hmm. now? So my we had some friends come from Texas to stay with us, which is where we're from. And we're here in Nashville now. And they have a, a young boy that's the same age as my son. And they immediately sprinted out back on our property and went to the barn where it was just full of just crap. And my son comes running up and he goes, Dad, can I borrow your tools? 
And that's one of my favorite questions a little boy can ask. And also, all right, what? And he said, we want to take apart this old mower and do this and then this. And they built the raddest, like, I don't even know what it is, like a fort floaty thing that you put in a creek and float. Like, it was awesome. I let that moment and that creation that they came up with justify keeping a bunch of old mowers, a bunch of old stuff. And here's the truth. Mm -hmm. Had I not had a bunch of old mowers, those boys would have figured out how to put a bunch of sticks together and it would not have hampered their imagination. It wouldn't have hampered this, this, and this. And so I think I'm always planning for this. And then I have these little moments where, hey, John, will you come play guitar with us on this one thing? And I'm like, see, I need seven (laughs) guitars and all these amplifiers and all this stuff. It's not true. It's not true. It's just not true. Mm -hmm. And so me doing the harder work, the easy work is to pretend that I know what's coming down the road and then to reverse engineer it. Mm -hmm. The harder work is being present right now with boredom and discomfort and that feeling that I'm finite and I don't know what's coming. Right. That's a way scarier place to be. Right. You know, I, I'm sure you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy mm-hmm. of needs, right? Some call it the hierarchy of happiness because really he was, I believe he was trying to get at what makes humans happy, mm-hmm. right? It's really interesting if you look at it because on the bottom are our base needs, mm-hmm. right? We need to feel safe. We need to have shelter. We need food. But then as you move up, you're moving. There's love. Love is on mm-hmm. there. Very important, right? Right. And then you're moving up towards self-actualization and and all these great things that I think many of us strive for. But what's so hard is that I feel like in in our society and culture today, we get bogged down in this base level because we need a house. Mm -hmm. But then marketing and our neighbors say, you need a bigger house. Mm -hmm. You need a car. Most of us need a car to get to where we're going. Oh, but you need a nicer car. You need nicer clothes. And so we get caught down in this bottom level where... We're just trying to upgrade the things when that need is already met. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll look at someone buys a new car, right? Their happiness goes up for two weeks Mm -hmm. and then it just goes back and it's slightly higher than where it was, you know, and we, we all know this. And I think there is a part where we, we have to be really honest with ourselves and say, you know what? I have a choice, Mm -hmm. right? I can choose to continue to maintain all of these things. And if you want to keep lawnmowers for that off chance that your son is going to use it someday or play with it, we can, Mm -hmm. right? Or we can say, you know what? I, I really, I need a house that is the right size for me to keep it tidy and to stay on top of. I, I really just need enough clothes to get by each. I know we've talked about clothes. And so to recognize, to look at our life and say, where have I been trying to upgrade things that have not needed it's brought no extra happiness, no extra satisfaction, no lasting mm-hmm. happiness. Even my 10-year-old the other day, he goes, Mom, do you know what I've noticed? He was like, I I save up because I really want a new toy. Mm-hmm. And then I get it. And a couple of days later, it's not that special anymore. And Dude, I'm like, like, I won. My work right? here is done, right? And I was just like, I, you know, I was very proud. I really try, you know, even though I'm the minimal mom, I try to like not harass my kids right. about yeah, it. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, I am modeling it, right? I'm modeling <laughs> it. I'm letting them. I don't want the internet to think I'm like cruel to my kids and they can't have toys. They are allowed mm-hmm. to keep the things they want to keep. Um, but I'm like, wow, even a 10 year old can recognize mm-hmm. this. And we had a great conversation around it. And so can we look at the data? Can we look at the facts? Yeah, I got that new thing and my happiness went right back to where it was. Can we start to loosen our grip on this stuff and say, you know what, there are greater things. There are bigger things that I want to do with my life. I think there's a wholesale, it's slowly, um, gosh, I'm trying to think like, it's like a firework show unfolding. Maslow's hierarchy doesn't work because we're there. We're self-actualized. We have everything. Yeah. And Now we're asking a harder question, which is, was the self ever designed to hold up the universe? And it's not. Mm -hmm. And when you stack it up the way it is, and I've done academic presentations on Maslow, like I lived by it, I ran my departments by it, but what happens is you end up using people so that you can be Mm. whole. You end up using stuff so that you can be whole. Right. (laughs) Well, and it ends up being, you you read the, the Desert Fathers, you read folks who come out of prison for a long time and they took a philosophical track to that. People who lose everything, Mm -hmm. right? Um, I recently had somebody here who was a famous comedian, lost everything, made some -hmm. some tough, rough choices and lost everything and then has slowly had to like build redemption back Mm -hmm. um, or walk the path of redemption. And it ends up being 
oh, we need so much less than we thought. Mm -hmm. And that hierarchy sets us up to go chase a thing so that we can feel a certain way someday. Mm -hmm. And what we're all figuring out is that's not how that works. No. You right. get there it's and the finish line moves. Yeah. And then the finish line moves. Yes. And so what does it look like to take ownership of you're still trying to get stuff so that that girl in high school will tell you that she finally likes you mm -hmm. or that your dad will finally call and say, I'm proud of you. Yeah. And that call's probably not coming. Yeah. Right. And that's a scarier reality yeah. than I just need to earn 10,000 more dollars so that I can get this car. Yeah. Right. And I think it gets messy because it gets on both sides of the bell curve. You have the people who are get, get, get. And then you have the people who are any sort of ambition, any sort of desire is evil and wrong too. Yeah. The example I give is, is my friend Winston. He had the, a new, the new hybrid Tundra, which is just an amazing machine. It's awesome. And I needed a new truck. I drove his around. I was like, that's it. And so I told my wife, we're saving up because that's what I'm getting. She's like, great, you need a new truck because I'm scared every time you're in your old truck, you're going to die. And I saved up the money, went out there to get it. And then I just couldn't, I couldn't pull it. I couldn't spend that kind of money on a, on a car, on a depreciating asset. And I left in a Highlander. And my buddies here, they're like, you got a what? Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And it gets me to work and back. Yeah. And so it was, the the ambition was cool. The desire was cool. Yeah. Thinking through it was cool. And if I'd bought the truck, it would have been fine. Yeah. But it allowed me some space to say, it's not going to make you feel better about yeah. your life. And in fact, it's going to be harder on you because y'all aren't financially, you can do it, but it doesn't yeah. make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And so asking yourself, like, what do you need? Yeah. And letting the other work be the other work, not trying to figure it out with books and stuff and plates and new furniture right. and bigger houses and more cars. It, it just doesn't work. Right. And I mean, that's what I really appreciate about your new book, Building a Non-Anxious Life, is you have the six daily choices. And what I think is neat about this is I feel like there is an on-ramp at every choice, right? From mm -hmm. decluttering to getting our bodies physically moving mm -hmm. again to mindfulness. And and you've acknowledged that some of those things come more easily to yeah. each of us, oh, right? Yeah. And so you kind of get to pick the most natural entry point for you as you as you start to unravel these these daily choices. I think that's really cool because um, you you put out a video recently and it said it was can you build a non anxious life in 90 days. Mm -hmm. And so you had Eric on there and you were going through some of these daily choices with him. And he what was fascinating to me was he kept saying this feels too easy. Mm -hmm. Like, when is he going to give me the hard work or when is he going to give me the harder things? But really, it came down to, I mean, the things you were asking him to do, get outside and go for a walk mm -hmm. every day, turn off the news, connect with your wife, you mm -hmm. know, each day. And none of these things cost any money. Mm -hmm. We don't have to buy anything. I mean, you can literally buy John's book and have a <laughs> blueprint here for the next 90 days. But as he went through it, uh, it was really cool. And I'll link to the, the video to see the impact that it had on his life after 90 days and his feelings of emptiness, of feeling like um, he had to perform for love. How as he started to be aware of these things and to put them into action, um, the massive changes that he was seeing in his life. Well, it's kind of like going to the you go to the gym every day for six months. Let's just say you make a personal commitment. I'm going to go to the gym every day for six months and you go you're no matter what your body will change and it changes so incrementally mm -hmm. and it's when you run into that friend from college who's yeah. like oh my gosh right or yeah. more importantly a box falls out of the back of your car and is about to hit your kid and you grab it and you hold it and you realize oh, i just grabbed that thing and yeah. held it right yeah i had i have strength that i didn't know i had yeah and eric kept saying like this is so stupid like, yeah. i'm going for walks <laughs> right. like i'm writing down when i'm in a bad mood yeah. Then he went to a family get together mm -hmm. and it had a, a blow up and he finds himself going for a walk and yeah. he's sobbing and then the the track kicked up and he's like, yeah. they don't get a vote. And, the, and he's yeah. like, oh my gosh, I'm right. And so it was yeah. when the thing happened. Yeah. And I think most of us live such margin free lives. We have no margin. Yeah. We have no, not a square inch left in our house. Mm -hmm. And then out of nowhere, somebody calls and says, can I come spend three nights at your house? Because I'm getting abused. I got to get out of my house. Mm -hmm. And you got nowhere for them to stay. Right. That's when you go, oh, gosh. Right. right. Or your, you know, your budget is not what can you afford, but how many can I make this credit card payment? What's the minimum payment? You fill your whole budget up with that. Mm -hmm. And then your engine blows up yeah. and you're sunk. Right. Yeah. 
And so, yeah, this is, I, I don't, I, I struggle with like the seven step plan too. I just don't think that's most of our lives. Yeah. But I do think if I have a place where I can continue to go back to, because mm-hmm. the whole premise is, I don't think we're, I, I think our, if we're anxious, I think our body's working yeah. pretty well. It's getting our yeah. attention. So if it, if the alarms are going off, mm-hmm. I need a, like a, I need some sort of map to say, okay, can I just run through this real quick and go, oh, dude, I haven't worked out in two weeks. Right. I ate all my kids' Halloween candy mm-hmm. all week. And of course I feel bad, right? right. And right. I'm not broken. I don't yeah. need to like quit everything. I probably need to spend about 10 days cleaning my diet up right. or I've been on a, on a click binge on Amazon prime and I got right. lots of boxes right. and now right now <laughs> this is so perfect in my garage. I have a treadmill covered in small Amazon boxes and it's just this mound of shame. Like I just look at it. I'm like, gosh, don't want me. <laughs> and so a, I got to go deal with the boxes. Yeah. B it's covering up something that brings value to my life. And see it, it, it's a signal that I got to address a deeper it problem, you yeah. know, in, in the machinery. So, yeah. um, I think for most of us, a couple of those are very simple. If you tell me like you need to go exercise, that's fine. As we've talked, mm-hmm. you need to address the clutter and both in your garage and in your writing space and in your calendar. Right. Okay. Cause that says a lot about Deloney's identity and that's gonna yeah. be a harder thing for me. Yeah. And for some people walking into a gym is so exposing and vulnerable. It's scary. Mm-hmm. Some people having that hard conversation with your spouse, brutal. Right. right? right. And so er, I like to say almost the entry point is not the easiest point. Your entry point is probably the one that makes you go, I'm not doing that. I think like, <laughs> that's probably where you should head. Right. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, this is actually what I like about decluttering is that it's not like weight loss or getting out of debt. Like, it, it, I mean, even anyone, anyone that's watching right now, you could stand up and go to your kitchen and straighten up your kitchen, and you're gonna you're gonna feel better instantly. And you're gonna be like, okay, I I just did something. I, and I've you know heard it said that we don't need motivation, we need momentum, mm-hmm. right? We need to do it today and then tomorrow. Motivation again, is and then, a complete waste of time. Right. I mean, we're waiting for it to come, and it never it comes. It never or comes. It comes at the wrong time. Yes. <laughs> and, on on anything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But if we will do five minutes of tidying up, isn't it amazing how we're like, okay, like Mm -hmm. I just followed through with a commitment after I have probably broke 10 other commitments to myself. That's right. right? I have no, no trust left with myself, but I could set the timer for five minutes and go pick up. I could go for a short walk today. I could start to be a little more mindful of these things Mm -hmm. that are coming into my mind. And so what I always appreciate about your books is it it never feels like you are talking down to us. You're never saying this is what you need to do. It it feels like you are a friend coming along. I'm a train wreck too, man. (laughs) You're like, I am two steps ahead of you and I will drag you with me forward, right? Yeah. Well, you hit on something that since the book's been out, um, and I've never had this happen, but I'll do interviews with radio people. And then we get done with the radio and they say, hey, you got a second. Yeah. And I've never experienced that. But where it's been really important is the stuff that we're anxious about is almost never the thing. And Mm -hmm. the more I think most of us don't like what we see in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And I think that even beneath that, most of us have lost trust in us. Yep. Right. I don't trust myself to take care of my body like I've said a million times. Mm -hmm. I don't trust myself because I missed it when my spouse was X, Y, and Z, and I missed it, right? And that made me sad and mad, but I don't trust me anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't trust myself when it comes to like, no, I'm not going to eat that cake tonight. Mm -hmm. And you're on piece three, and you're just like, the only thing that makes this shame go away is another piece of cake, right? (laughs) Right? But I think we've lost trust in ourselves. And if you're like me, I try to get all that trust back in one fell swoop. Yeah. And it's just not how trust works, yeah. right? I don't know. Like if I found out my wife had a secret credit card that had $80,000 on it, her cutting that card up isn't going to instantly make me feel better. Right. It's going to be months of us going through the budget together and her being honest about all the stuff. Then slowly I'm going to build that back. I have to give myself that same allowance and it's mm-hmm. five minutes at a time, right? Yeah. It's, I'm going to, we talked about this earlier, I'm going to get rid of 10 books. Yeah. And we're going to get rid of 10 books. Mm-hmm. And then I am going to take one second and pat myself on the back. As cheesy as that is, it's mm-hmm. a good job. Yeah. And then I'm going to sit in that discomfort. Like, you just let your identity leave. Yep. And then I'm going to feel how good that feels. Yeah. And then I'm going to circle back and do five more minutes. Yeah. So, John, what would you say to those who are watching who are like, I'm tired. I'm, I think weary is a mm-hmm. good word right now. Um, 
I just, I don't even know if I have it in me to try again yeah. because I failed. I know uh, the Navy SEALs, they have, they have the 40% rule. Hmm. And it says that like when they're training and they're going through all their super intense training, um, they see that when you physically say you are at the end of yourself, you're only 40% there. You have 60% left. And I think most of us are sitting here, we're like, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Like, I just, I don't have it in me. So how would you coach us to say like, no, there, you have, you have 60% left. Like, what do we do? Well, I, I think one of the important revelations right in the book was, was some time spent with, um, an author named Michael Easter who wrote a book called the comfort crisis, which is a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. But from that conversation, in, in the book is really this discussion about our bodies are designed to do hard things all the time. And very unintentionally, we've created a world where hard has become the thing we're trying to solve, yeah. right? And so if I have a body that's designed for this, it's like having a collie or like an Australian shepherd in a one bedroom apartment. <laughs> that dog was created to run and herd and yeah. do jobs for you. Yeah. And if you don't, it goes insane and yeah. you go insane, right? So a phrase that I took from that com those conversations with, with Michael has been, choose your heart. Mm. And it's really, really hard to live life 100 pounds overweight. Mm -hmm. Your back hurts, your knees hurt, you're uncomfortable a lot, you feel people looking at you, like all of that yeah. stuff. And it's very, very hard to lose 100 pounds. Yeah. One isn't the easier route, yeah. right? It's very hard to live in a marriage where you're not together. It's also very hard to sit down and say, are we gonna keep doing this? Mm -hmm. It's not one is easier than the other. Right. So when it comes to like, I'm out, I'm, I'm exhausted, right? We're, we're two years away from COVID and nothing's right. Politics are crazy, you're overseas stuff, money, inflation, all this stuff, mm -hmm. I'm done. That's where I would say you can choose your heart. Yeah. You can cash out and that's going to be hard. It's going to be hard because this low level burn of anxiety that never goes away yeah. is just going to slowly ratchet up. You can do that mm -hmm. and it actually makes sense and I get it. Yeah. And I'll come have nachos with you. It, yeah. Like it makes sense. Or you can do the other hard thing, which is my, my buddy Sal says he, he's a, um, he works, he's a physical, a, a trainer forever. Mm -hmm. And he said, Almost always when he hires, when, when clients hire him, they come in and start and they'll miss a few workouts at the beginning. They'll say, I'm just too worn out. And about six months to a year later, they're calling him and saying, I'm so out of energy. I need to book another two weeks. Right. And so you can cash out and it's going to be hard. Or you can do the other hard thing, which is I'm going to give myself 10 minutes today mm -hmm. to declutter some stuff. Yeah. I'm going to find margin for 10 minutes and then that's it. And I'm going to put that on my calendar and I'm not going to rely on motivation. I'm not going to rely on how I feel. I'm going to make a promise to myself seven days, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking, this is the pot talking to the kettle yeah. here. I'm actually mapping what I'm going to do in real time, <laughs> but I'm going to, I am going to make a 10 minute commitment to myself mm -hmm. to get rid of some junk in my house. Yeah. And then I'm going to give myself the, the, a moment and it might be 60 seconds to feel how good that feels. Yeah. That I told myself the truth and I followed through it even when I didn't feel like it. That's going to be hard. Yeah. And it's not a matter of one's easier than the other. It's a matter of choose your heart. Yeah. And I'm going to go choose the heart that on in the long run is going to give me peace. Yeah. And do you think uh, maybe a missing piece of the puzzle is that we've been trying to do it on our own, that we don't actually invite other people into this at all? Is there a place? I mean, if I'm trying to lose 100 pounds or get out of my house, can't. what if I can't afford a trainer? Yeah. What do I do? I think we... I think you smile that we live in this bizarre little snapshot in history where there's no lack of information. It's all out there. And you can get in touch with somebody in an online community. It's a proxy, but it's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. um, I can make the phone call and reach out to people. I can go be weird and say, I'm not okay. Are you okay? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I will circle out and go speak to groups of men in... Um, SA or in some of these addiction groups and just mm -hmm. as like a guest speaker, but they're meeting in houses all over my community and I didn't even know they were there, yeah. right? Um, they're meeting in, in the back rooms of churches all over the place. You can find some people that you can walk in a room and say, I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. It's you deciding I'm going to choose that hard over the heart of yeah. another night watching Netflix and another night in shame and yeah. another night of staying up too late and starting that whole cycle over again. Yeah. And I don't, I don't 
want to miss an opportunity to talk about this again today about the importance of the relationships. And I know that's a key in here and even all your books, you you talk about this. And, you know, they're like the longest running study on happiness now. They're like the number one Just predictor people. of happiness is relationships. And mm-hmm. I'm like, duh, like yeah. how much money did you waste on that study, right? Right. <laughs> um, and so how does being in relationship, how does does that decrease our anxiety and our stress? Well, it, it's, I mean, I like to just take the, to be a nerd about it, the evolutionary psychology. If, 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 let me put it this way. If your body scans the environment and realizes you got nobody and the data tells us one out of two have not one person yeah. to call in the middle of the night, zero people, and eight out of 10 people don't know what you're really going through, including your spouse. They don't know where you truly are spiritually, emotionally, physically, sexually. They don't know, right? Mm. Um, when your body recognizes that you're on an island, it, if it let you sleep all night, it would be failing you. It'd be, it'd be letting you down because you're the only one you got. If it wasn't making you anxious and rattle and looking around and being mm-hmm. hypervigilant all the time, it would be failing you Yeah. because you're the only one watching the kids. You're the only one looking to see if there's a tribe coming over the hills to kill you all. You're the only one looking for food. You're the only one doing all these tasks and our bodies aren't designed for that. Um, I do think there's been, um, and I've had to check myself, I, to not over hit the pendulum. I do think you can make incredible strides with one person that you trust, okay. with two or three people mm-hmm. that you trust. It's not, you don't have to get 50 people. You don't have to get 25 people. And there's a, there's a significant difference between loneliness and solitude. I think solitude's mm-hmm. an important spiritual practice. Sure. My wife loves being out in the garden for hours alone. And as an introvert who loves solitude, she knows I got to go with once a week with my girlfriends yeah. and we just got to, I got to tell the world how well, this guy's kind of a lame, even though he's got a show, right? Yeah. Um, you have to have both, right? Yeah. And I, as a guy who likes to be around and doing all this, I have to build in solitude mm-hmm. also, right? Sure. Um, but I think the work is you got to find somebody that you can say, Whew, I'm not okay. Yeah. And by the way, you got to be able to tell them the tough stuff, but you got to be able to tell them the good stuff too. Yeah. You got to have a person that says like, <laughs> hey, I did 10 days in a row of 10 minutes yeah. and I got rid of a whole bunch of yeah. books. And them not go, why are you calling me? But them go, that's awesome, man. Right. I don't even know what you're talking about, but that's fantastic. Right? right. And do you think in some ways we need to lower the bar a little bit? Because, oh you know, I think gosh. back to my mom growing up and, you know, we grew up in, in the country. And so there was one neighbor that mm-hmm. was in a similar season of life and they would go on walks like almost every night after work. And now they've kind of drifted apart a little bit and they're not as close. And I don't know that they would choose each other Mm -hmm. in this season now because there's so many options out there and ways to connect with people. And so in some ways, do we need to say, I need to look at proximity. Like I do need another mom in my neighborhood who I can just go for. And she might be a little annoying or she might be, you know, like we might not have everything in common. And you're going to go. Yeah. Right. So I, I, um, a few months ago, I was on a, on an event as, as a speaker, and Malcolm Gladwell was there, and he said something live that I had never considered before. And so, when your body recognizes you're lonely, your brain instantly divides the world up into us and them. Who's in my tribe mm-hmm. and who's not? And all of us have outsourced tribe to m- about five things that we all agree or don't agree sure. on. What's your pro-life, not pro-life stance? What's yeah. your stance on guns? What's your stance like? Yeah. And you check these boxes, mm-hmm. and if you check them all, yeah. you're on my team. If you check none, if you check one or four out of the five, you're on that team, and I hate you, right? Yeah. And Gladwell said, what if you flip the whole script and said, before we go to the things that we disagree on, what are the things that we do agree on? Mm-hmm. And he said, your list would be a thousand to five. You want your kids to have some fun? Yes. Do you want to have like a pretty good marriage? Yes. Do you want to have like as much laughter and joy and sex in your houses? Yes. Do you want your kids to have food? Yes. <laughs> the list of what you agree on yeah. would be infinite. Yeah. And then you would get to these five things. And by the time you got to those five things at mm-hmm. the dinner table, nobody cares. Yeah. Or it's, you're able to go, that's stupid. Right. And they go, you're stupid. And then you're like past the nachos, right? Right, right. And so I don't know if it's lowering the bar. I think it's flipping the whole script from how media Mm -hmm. has told us we're supposed to treat each other and how we define if we're safe or not. I want to define if I'm safe. Um, Well, I'll just just give you this story. No, I won't give you that story. That's probably not great. I I know that was just like a middle school boy being like, (laughs) I know someone who likes you and I'm not telling. I know, but it's not smart. So um, I think it's a matter of that mom in my neighborhood, I never would have... We would not have hung out in college. Yeah. Both of us want to have healthy kids. 
Both of us like to go for walks. Both of us probably need to go get like shower more than once a week right now, right? We have all these things in common. Yeah. And I don't really care about these other four things. Yeah. We'll we'll n- navigate that when we get there. Right. I'm going to call and see if she wants to go for a walk. Because statistically, she's lonely too. Uh, right? Where, almost I mean, it's guaranteed. It's nerve-wracking to be right. the first one almost to make guaranteed. that phone call. Yep. But how grateful would she probably be for yep. you to reach out to? Well, and my, my, it, it's the things you learn from your middle school kids. My son had, they have some kids that are in a special class and they are working on these projects and, and then they're all in theater. So my son calls them his nerd friends and mm-hmm. they're all like, they're all, that's how they self-identify. And then he ran in a parking lot a couple of weeks ago at a school event. He ran into a friend that he had and they were all over carving pumpkins. And if you can imagine some nerdy middle schoolers, the pumpkins were a riot. What they <laughs> were carving was so astounding mm-hmm. and creative and good. But he invited her too. And I was like, oh, that's going to be weird. That's a tight gang. And then there's an outsider. Yeah. Didn't matter. No. Yeah. And there was 13 seconds of weird. Yeah. And then it was like, well, pass the knife. And then they're carving and it's hilarious. And she wrote a note, just said, hey, that meant, oh, no, it was her mom that wrote a note to my wife. It was yeah. like, thank you for that. Yeah. And I'm like, that's 13 year olds can figure that out. Yeah. Like, hey, just come on. Yeah. And it's the adults in the room. They're like, well, what's your stance on? Like, I don't right. have, I, we're literally dying. I don't have time. Yeah. I don't have time. Like, you're welcome. Everybody's welcome in my house. Mm-hmm. Just make sure you bring something delicious and let's, let's hang out. We have to, we have to have that posture. Yeah. Because look around, what we're doing is not working. Right. Well, why don't, you know, as long as we're bringing up kids too, let's talk about anxiety and kids real quick before we wrap up. If, if I am sensing anxiety from the kids mm-hmm. in my home, from my children, I'm worried that perhaps I have been modeling that or that they're picking up on my stress and anxiety what would be a what would be a first step that I can do to start to work on this? Um, so I love that you mentioned that kids, and I hate to say this because as an anxious guy, kids are environmental sponges. Yeah. And so ninety five percent of the time, when somebody says, "Hey, how do I? What do I do with my anxious kid?" I always tell them, "Work on your marriage," or go get really involved in their school and find out what's going on there. Because that's, that's the two places where most kids spend their time. But kids absorb their environment, and they reflect it back to you. Mm-hmm. And so almost always in my house, my kids' angst is a reflection of what I'm bringing home mm-hmm. or the state of me and my wife or what she's bringing home. And so the bigger challenge is how do I create a peaceful home? A scary, scary exercise that my wife and I did, um, and this is several years ago. This is probably five or six years ago. We were sitting across the table, and we are deciding if we are going to stay married. And it was like every second has to change if this if we're gonna keep do this like we had to rebuild the whole thing. And one of the ways we did that she's she was Dr. Deloney before me, and so she's really good with words. I'm good with words. We can talk a good game. We both said, "What do we want this house to feel like when you walk in the door?" Mm-hmm. And that shifted because I was like, "I want this house to feel warm, and I want mm-hmm. to be filled with laughter, yeah. and I want it to be filled with whatever." Mm-hmm. And she said, "I want it to be filled with stability mm-hmm. and peace." Yeah. And then from that, how do we want this thing to feel? I was like, I don't know how to be stable. <laughs> like I, like my identity is chaos and fun and bringing it all. Yeah, I need to go talk to somebody. Mm-hmm. And it, I spent several years in therapy, right? I need you to default to laughter first. And she was like, that's not my, I need, I need to go talk to somebody, right? Yeah. And let's create warmth. Let's don't create sterility, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think it's asking that question, mm-hmm. how do you want this house to feel? And the kids will absorb that back. Yeah. And then in my house, I've done a bunch of work. We've, I've watched with my daughter who's seven, I've watched her tension release in a profound mm-hmm. way. And I noticed that it grims back up when she goes to school. Mm. And that gave me and my wife a path. And sure. we went and met with the team, like a team of people in her local local public school. They didn't know some things were going on. And now we're getting her the supportive help she needs. And the mm. school is recognizing. And I think mm. school should have caught that. I do. Yeah. And I've worked in schools like y'all should have. You missed. But here yeah. we are. But it gave me an avenue. Right. Um, and then there are, I, we've sought out a, a clinician. And the clinician's got some good ideas with physical therapy and teaching kids. Like, so there's there's professionals out there too. Yeah. But I think it's important for parents to go to the mirror first. Yeah. And that's awful. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. It reminds me uh, in the book Simplicity Parenting, um, he works with families about you know decluttering and simplifying. And he said parents will always ask like, how do I get my kids to keep their room clean and to declutter and keep pick your room it up? Clean. He's like, do your room first, and oh, I'm just like, gosh, darn it. <laughs> so well, so but I, it's good and bad, right? Because 
we can make huge progress with our kids without even saying a word. You say a word. You don't say a word. Yeah. I get home late a lot just from my job. And so often I I take my, like I change in the living room because everybody's asleep. And then I get up the next morning and I walk into my son's room and I'm like, dude, pick your pants up and your shoes. Why is your stuff everywhere? And then I turn around and walk in the living room. And I, <laughs> my pants are hanging over. My shoes are there. My T-shirt's laying there. And it's like, oh, gosh. You know what I mean? Right. It's like uh, the, the parent who's out smoking and then his 15-year-old smoking. And he's like, yeah. you can't do that. And he's like, you know what I mean? So, yeah, it's it's I don't like it. Mm-hmm. But like you say, I don't need to go immediately jump to something's wrong with my kid. There's not. They're yeah. just absorbing their environment. Yeah. Um, and I'm not broken. I actually am yeah. loving my wife by not going in the bedroom and changing in the, at 2 a.m. Right. when I get home. But I can put my stuff up, yeah. right? And it's both and. Yeah, that's awesome. Ugh. Well, John, so great to get to visit with you today. Yeah. We'll link to your book, uh, Building a Non-Anxious Life. Thank you. Um, and thank you for all that you do. And do we have like the coolest jobs ever? I'm just, we're so grateful for you and uh, everyone who watches yeah. and how cool is it? I love so. it that I get to meet really <laughs> like caring, smart people that are my friends that beyond these conversations, I could be like, hey, can you help? (laughs) (laughs) And then I think the last time we did, you were like, I think this one guy said, and I was like, oh gosh, (laughs) now she's using my words against me. If you turn to page 64. (laughs) I'm so good at telling other people how to do it, but um, but no, it's, yeah, it's like we're living a glitch in the matrix. Pretty cool. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you.